we're in the middle of some fast solar wind, we have some gorgeous filament eruptions, and some active regions both on the sun's front side and on the sun's far side are growing. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is getting pretty active. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have this massive coronal hole we've been dealing with over the past few days, and we're going to continue to deal with it for the, probably the next two or three days before things finally calm down. We have been getting some fast wind from this pocket here. All of this in here, however, is pretty much at higher latitudes, so Earth is just barely getting grazed by this fast solar wind. Therefore, we've only been seeing active to possibly uh, minor storm conditions kind of on and off throughout this past week. We will continue to see that as time goes on. But that's not the big story. The bigger story has to do with these regions right here. We have region 4136, 4139, and a couple others that have been growing in here. These have been firing off smaller solar flares, but they're growing quite rapidly. So we're going to be expecting that the risk for radio blackouts is, is going to continue to rise over the next couple days. Plus, you'll see this filament here get blown off, uh, re mainly from activity from this region here, kind of destabilize the edge of this filament. And we'll talk more about that in a sec. But first, I want you to see over here, region 4041 and a couple regions on the sun's far side. Look at this. You see this massive filament eruption. You can't really see it from SDO's view, but when we switch to the SUVI instrument, on goes, we sure can see this thing. So again, this is from Earth's view. So this is activity that's happening essentially on the far side. But look at this eruption and this gorgeous filament. It's not Earth directed, but it was it was part of a huge eruption on the sun's far side. And as we take a look in coronagraphs, you can see this massive partial halo. You would think that this would be Earth directed, but it really isn't. This is all blowing basically away from Earth. So we're not getting any Earth impact from that. But boy, was this beautiful beautiful eruption. However, that's not the only one. Just shortly after that one erupted, look at region 4136. Like I said, all this activity in this area really causes this filament to lift off. You can't really see that. It kind of disappeared for a sec. Because the image did because we were in eclipse season, which means that the moon comes between the sun and the SDO spacecraft. So sadly, we kind of blacked out right when this filament left off. But again, as we switch to our SUVI instrument, you can see just a gorgeous display. Look at this filament eruption. Just beautiful. Whoosh. Now look at this. See the edge of this? This is region 4136. And this is the scar that tears off of the sun right here. Now this part right in here is in the Earth strike zone. But as we watch the bulk of this filament lift off, do you see how it's all kind of going to the northeast? Sadly, despite the fact that it looks like we could get clipped by this region or by this filament eruption, we probably won't. In fact, as we take a look at the, uh, the view in coronagraphs, you can see this big you know, not even really a partial halo, but you can see this big signature of that structure going basically to the northeast of Earth. Sadly, there is a filament eruption that also occurs off to the west, and that means that it, whatever we, signature might have been down in here is kind of getting camouflaged by this. So likely we're not going to get hit by this filament eruption, probably just going to get a little bit of a bumpy ride, but that might be along with the tail end of this fast solar wind. So can't say that we're going to have any Earth-directed solar storms right now. However, these regions are still being very active. You can see them right here. In fact, we're going to get another number here in just a moment as uh, right there as more and more of these regions begin to pop out here. So as this cluster begins to rotate to the west limb, expect that 
uh, the noise on the bands to continue to rise. Expect the risk for radio blackouts to rise. In fact, I think we're sitting at about 15% chance of an R3 level radio blackout just right now. And that could increase over the next couple days. It also means we could see a bigger risk for radiation storms. So you aviators definitely pay attention because, and those people who care about uh, uh, high latitudes, we could definitely see a risk for radiation storms growing over the next couple days. But outside of that, we're just going to be paying attention very much to what's going on on the sun's far side and getting rid of this coronal hole while we're waiting for this new one to, to rotate into the Earth strike zone, which will happen probably in about 10 days. And now taking a look at our far-sided sun, we can use Stereo A imagery again because Stereo A has finally orbited beyond the west limb of the sun from Earth's view and it can still see part of the sun's far side. So in fact, as we look at Stereo imagery, you can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a bit from the side. In fact, you can really see that that coronal hole that we see at Earth's view has still is pretty much you know, on the eastern side of the sun, only a small extension of it is on the western side of the sun from Stereo's view. And Stereo can still see region 4130 and 4134. In fact, this is where all of that activity is with that, all those southern eruptions and that big filament eruption. So as we watch as this region, rot they rotate to the west limb here, uh, about on the 15th, you can see a big eruption going off there, and now that lights off this. You'll see this big tear all the way down as that filament lets go. Watch it, look at that all the way down. So there's at least two, if not three eruptions right there. Then we get another one, boom, right there. And then we get another one pretty, pretty soon after that, within 24 hours or so, boom, there's another, boom. So how many is that? Like five? My goodness, this just a light with activity on the sun's far side right now. And so we're going to be watching these very closely. Sadly, they're moving out of Stereo A's view, but we'll look at them in the full sun map because Solar Orbiter is staring at the sun's far side, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. But as you can see, the activity continues to rise, and that means that in about 10 to 12 days, when these regions rotate back into Earth view, we will be watching to see if they are still solar storm producers. And now switching to our full sun map, we're taking a look at stereo AIA imagery. That's what you see here in red, as well as Sorbiter, solar orbiter EUI imagery. That's what's in blue. This is the far side of the sun. This is the front side of the sun. You can see the east limb and the west limb from Earth's view sitting right here. So this is what the front side of the sun looks like right now. Quite a few active regions. The far side doesn't look too shabby either. We've got quite a few active regions there. Over the past week, you could, as I put this in motion, you can see regions 4130, 4134. You can see all of that activity. This is that where that southern filament eruption occurred. All of that activity continues to grow. You can see even new regions growing. So we definitely know that we're going to be getting some activity all around the far side. In fact, Solar Orbiter has been showing uh, big solar flares over the last few days in particular, up at, a, at almost an R2 level radio blackout. So we're paying attention. On top of that, let me back this up just a smidge. And you can see we've got a new region that's been uh, emerging on the sun's disk. This is from Solar Orbiter. Solar Orbiter's view starting around the 11th. This one, has, well, let me see if I can back it up a little bit more. Uh, maybe around the 10th, my goodness. Yes, around the 10th, that's when this region started wrote, or started emerging. That's about when we started seeing some of these bigger flares. But you can also see a couple other flaring regions up in here, 4144. You can see 4125 and 4127. These regions, this one here is also associated with all of the activity we've seen in the south there. So believe it or not, the sun's far side is really a kind of a bigger hotbed of activity than the front side right now. We're going to see this region rotate into Earth view in probably about three to four days. So get ready, amateur radio operators and emergency responders. We could start seeing some flare risk really begin to rise, not just over this week, but also over next week as well, as some of these other regions begin to rotate into Earth view. So enjoy the quiet while you have it. And now stepping outside to look at our current conditions with our global geochron map, we'll take a look at the ROTI index first. This is the risk for scintillation at high frequencies like GPS frequencies. And you can see all the little hot spots. It's been quite active, not just on the night side. You can see the shadow here shows the night side of Earth, whereas the lit up side shows the day side. But you can also see some stuff periodically at high latitudes. So lots of little red hot spots everywhere. And that's mainly because we've had 
quite a bit of activity with the the fast solar wind causing mild geomagnetic storming. That kind of stuff just happens. It causes a lot more scintillation. So if you are a GPS user or a drone flyer, just know that things are a bit uh, on the dicey side. Be sure to check your, you know, be sure to, to, to calibrate your magnetometers often and just be vigilant for, you know, for scintillation, for, for loss of uh, GPS reception. Now, as we uh, switch to our DRAP uh, view, this is for lower frequencies like HF and VHF frequencies. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you guys pay attention to this. We're actually seeing just a few pops here and there, but for the most part, the uh, impacts have been pretty low in terms of uh, maximum frequency up to about 10 megahertz. So we're not really seeing much degradation in the radio communication. You can see here all the uh, amateur radio contacts being done, but we do get a little bit of a pop. I think there was one solar flare that got up into about the 20 uh, about 20 megahertz range in terms of some some issues here, but it was very brief, not for, you know, not really all that much. Expect, however, that this risk for radio blackouts to rise and expect the potential for R1 to R2 level radio blackouts to really pop up. We'll talk more about those in the five day, but overall things shouldn't be too bad. Now, as we switch to our Ovation Auroral model, well, we haven't been having a lot of activity. It's just been kind of low level. As you can see, we actually did reach up into the G1 level just a little bit. We had a bit of Aurora for a short period, but it always kinds of dies down quite quickly. So we're going to be sitting there at kind of just mild Aurora, not a lot for uh, those if, that aren't at high latitudes to see, probably not even all that much storm time Aurora. So most of it will be green arcs and such uh, for overall that's likely going to start dying down here over the next couple days but we do have potentially a bit of wake from that that filament eruption that's going northeast of earth we'll talk more about that in the five day because that might give us just a little bit of activity and now switching to our moon we are passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon and by the 22nd the moon will be only about seven percent illuminated so you night sky watchers if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky like i don't know maybe some aurora and remember the beginning of the perseid meteor shower is going to be starting here as we move into the latter part of july and into august so you might start seeing a bit more of those beautiful meteors uh you know now is a perfect time to take a look but expect that meteor count to rise by the day and now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating kind of a brush by with that solar storm that's kind of going to the northeast of Earth. So I've got it set on storm watch, but at high latitudes, we could be expecting active conditions. That's a combination of that storm plus the fast solar wind that we're still in. NOAA is giving us about a 20% chance of a major storm over the next day. That could continue into the 19th before things really begin to calm down. By the 20th, we're probably going to be sitting, settling back down into unsettled conditions, but we still have about a 30% chance of active conditions. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, it might be worth a look, especially on the 18th and the 19th. Now, as we switch to mid latitudes, well, we're really only expecting unsettled conditions. We still are going to have that storm watch over the 18th and 19th, but we're only going to have about a 10% chance of a minor storm, possibly on the 18th, if that thing clips us a little bit more than we expect. Then things should settle down, maybe a 30% chance of activity on the 19th, but by the 20th, things should be back to being reasonably quiet. Of course, with all of the different solar storms that keep launching over the with all these active regions on the Earth's disk or the sun's disk, this could change quite quickly. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the mid tri triple digits for solar flux right now, 150s to 155. This is because we have those cluster of active regions that are rotating to the west limb that are really beginning to get, uh, you know, really beginning to grow and show uh, risk for radio blackouts. Uh, NOAA's giving us about a 60% chance of R1 to R2 level radio blackouts on the day side. We are definitely seeing that moderate noise continue to rise. I'm extending that out out through about the five day, we may see a slight drop in uh, R1 to R2 level radio blackout risk, but I'm not going to drop it too low because we have those new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view. We also have about a 15% chance of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout over the next three days. And I've again extended that to the five day because it's kind of hard to tell what those regions on the sun's far side, how they're going to contribute to all of this. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders enjoy the quiet for the moment, but things are definitely ramping up. Now, as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming 
Thanksgiving week. Everything is in the green right now when it comes to radiation storms. We're sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We are having about a 10% risk of an S1 to S2 radiation storm right now. I'm going to see if that might rise up to about 15 or 20%, depending upon how quickly those regions that are rotating to the west limb grow. So this may be uh, changing quite quickly. So uh, all of you frequent flyers, and this does include you high-risk passengers and your air crew, keep an eye on those ICAO advisories because if radiation storm or if radio blackouts beginning to creep up, then likely the risk for radiation storms will creep up as well. So the space weather this week is getting pretty active. We have a couple gorgeous filament launches that uh, not are, are not Earth directed, but one of them might give us a little bit of a graze. Along with a fast solar wind we're going to be dealing with over the next couple days and until this thing kind of calms down. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you might get a bit of aurora. We'll have to kind of, you know, go out and take a look. But aurora photographers, if you're at mid latitudes, well, only if this thing is unexpectedly large and actually does hit us would I expect any show to be visible for you all. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, things are a bit quiet right now, but you might be noticing that noise ramping up on the dayside radio bands. Well, that's because we've got those active regions really growing. So the risk for radio blackouts is definitely on the rise, and we could see that through this week and possibly next week before things calm down. And now you GPS users, well, you know, right now things are okay, but the, radio, the roti scintillation is really... Uh, the risk for that is pretty big right now. So just stay vigilant both on the night side and on the day side. And of course, always stay vigilant near dawn and near dusk. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.